We're good. Okay. Now, I have named this presentation A Railway, Seed Potatoes, and a Female Architect. Those very different things are all going to come together when we talk this morning. Because really, those three things are integral to the story of Glen Oaks uh, uh, County Park. Um, which the centerpiece, of course, is this inc incredible structure, this, this clubhouse that was built. So I want to tell you that we had planned to be there this morning or this afternoon. And of course, the pandemic, like so many things, prevented us from going. But I want you to imagine you're walking through these cool doors into this beautiful banquet hall, which we had planned to meet at. Um, Look at the, the structure of it. Look at the architecture of it, the vaulted ceilings. That's going to be important later on. So just imagine that we were able to get there today. We will get there. Um, we'll be, as soon as things get better, we'll be doing some lectures out and about again and using this facility. Now, let me remind you also, though, that none of our parks started as parks or golf courses or the many things that we have, like our swimming areas, all of them were farms. All 14 were either one farm or a series of farms. And in some cases, we still have buildings left from those farms. This is the William Bailey House, 1878. It's at Independence Oaks. What's cool about this house is it's being restored and renovated. It's a joint project between Oakland County Parks, Preservation Clarkston and the Clarkston School District, which is using their trades program to renovate this house. It's an incredible house, an incredible project. And in January, I'll have a fireside chat about this building. If you were with me last time, we talked about the Ellis Barn, incredible structure that's at Springfield Oaks. So we have from farm to park, and then in some cases, we've been able to save the farm buildings. But some of our parks were different. They went from farm to country estate to park. There was a middle time. That's most true at, at the uh, at Addison Oaks. This is the Buell Mansion at Addison. So there were two major farms there that were purchased by the Buells, and then they used it as a country estate with this in incredible structure. The December fireside chat will feature this, the Buell Mansion, and the farms that became Addison Oaks. Then we have a couple parks that went from farm to golf course to park like the one we're gonna talk about today. That's the story of Glen Oaks County Park, from farm to golf course to park. And of course, the, the centerpiece of Glen Oaks is this, the clubhouse, the stone clubhouse that was there. But just think about for a minute. When you think of a, a, a structure, a building, it's just stone and wood and glass, that's, not the essence of a building. The essence of a building is its history. Glen Oaks happens to be a Michigan designated historic site. So it's the history that brings a building alive. And one thing I've learned about history is that it's best told as a story. And really stories are not about buildings. They're about people. Um, people like Emily Butterfield. This is Emily in 1907, hugely important in the story of Glen Oaks County Park. And we'll talk a lot about her today. So we don't want to concentrate on that building, but we want to concentrate on the people connected to the story of the building. So let me take you back to 1908. This is an Oakland County map from then. And let me geographically place Glen Oaks County Park. Right down here is Farmington Township in the southern tier of Oakland County Townships, right on the border with Wayne County. Then if I take just Farmington, the land that would become Glen Oaks 
was in sections two and three of Farmington Township, the northern sections. Most of you know that a township was divided into 36 sections, and that's really the key to learning the history of a, of a section of land, even your own house is what section is it in. So in this case, we're talking about sections two and three. If we close up on them, let me help you see road rise where we're talking about. Right here, that's Orchard Lake Road. And the crossroad is 13 Mile. So that's the area of Farmington Township we're talking about. And in 1908, what would become the county park was the farm of Milton Benjamin. The Benjamin family had been here for a long time in Oakland County, both in West Bloomfield Township and in Farmington. There were lots of Benjamins. Farm had been passed along until in early 1900s, it became the farm of Milton. Another critical farm to our history is the Isaac Bond farm. Now, interestingly enough, Isaac Bond, um, when he was a young boy, he worked for Milton Benjamin on his farm. And he said that he earned 50 cents an hour and a free lunch. So the Bonds and the Benjamins had connected, had been connected for quite a while. Isaac Bond actually didn't inherit the farm from his father by 1908. He had actually taken out a mortgage on it. Here is Isaac and his mother, Maria. Maria had a lot of health problems and the family had accumulated a lot of medical bills and they were in danger of losing their farm. And Isaac, who was just turned 20, was able to actually take out a mortgage on the farm himself and essentially save the family farm. So it's kind of a cool story between the connection of Isaac and his mother by 1908, his father had passed along and the two of them were running the farm. Here's the farm in 1915. I gotta tell you, I just wish the photographer had gone to the front of the house and maybe they did and I just can't find it. But it's a cool picture of the back of the house. We know the house was there in 1872 because it's on that map, but we're not sure how much older it is. And because we can't see the front, it, I'm seeing Greek Revival here, because which would be 1850, 1860, because if you look at the, the uh, wood along the, the heavy wood along the roof line, that would suggest Greek Revival. Here's another picture from 1915. Notice all these trucks. What are all the trucks doing parked at the Isaac Bond farm? Well, they were there to buy potatoes, seed potatoes. It turns out that Isaac had perfected a really good potato from Michigan, for our part of Michigan. And farmers would come every year to buy the seed potatoes from him. So he'd actually become quite famous for these seed potatoes and the farm was very, very successful. But in 1925, he decided to do something different with the farm. He organized a corporation with some partners, called it the Great Lakes Land Corporation, and their intention was to build a subdivision on the farmland. Now, that was happening throughout the southern tiers of Oakland County in the 1920s. And why was that happening? Automobiles. Cars had now made it possible to live in one area and work in another area. Roads had improved, cars were becoming more affordable. So now that so many people worked in Detroit, but now they were able to, to live outside Detroit. So we saw subdivisions starting. For example, the Vincetta Park subdivision. Here's Woodward Avenue. And back in here had been farmland. And essentially the Vincetta Boulevard was put in and the Vincetta Park subdivision. Notice what they were saying. Life in the country with all city conveniences. Another one that was actually even older than Vincetta was Northwood subdivision. Again, along Woodward at 12 Mile. So subdivisions were beginning to grow out away from Detroit along major roads. 
And that's what Isaac Bond and his partners had in mind. Subdivisions were growing along Woodward, so they wanted to go to a different place. So they chose Grand River and Orchard Lake Road, another made road. Also, this was the time when they had begun to build Northwestern Highway and plans were to complete that highway. So there were two major routes out of Detroit to get to the Oaklands, uh, the, the, what would become their subdivision, which they called the Oaklands. So they platted the Isaac Bond farm with roads with the intent of building a subdivision. They also purchased land on the other side of Orchard Lake Road, hoping at some time to expand it to that area. And then the Milton Benjamin farm, they turned into a golf course. Their idea was, it was one of the very first ones that was this subdivision embedded with a, with a golf course. The golf course was to be, you'll see in a minute, a private golf course, but the subdivision was right near it. Lots of the, I found in the Detroit Free Press and in Detroit News, lots of ads for the Oaklands. And they were promising a new and distinctly different suburban development. There were a lot along Woodward and they were beginning to look much the same. Not very big lots, not very big houses. They wanted to do something different. And you'll see in a minute what they decided on. Of course, one of the difference was putting a golf club there, which they described as a strictly private family club for young Americans of character and standing. I gotta tell you, when I see stuff like that, it always makes me nervous. When they're saying strictly private, character and standing, who was gonna measure that? I always fear at this time in our history that they were probably going to try and be restrictive um, and that it just suggests that to me, and you'll see what happened. We'll, we'll never know exactly the intent because of what happens with the plan. But when I read things like uh, only, only for people of character and standing, it makes me a little nervous. Now, the other big thing they promised was what they called generous lots. They said they wanted to develop this subdivision along different lines than the others that were being built. So instead of small single lots, which is what Vincetta and Northwood were doing, they were gonna divide and take six large generous lots to a block of property. So it would be literally six times the size of a traditional subdivision lot. They also were gonna put restrictions on the housing that could be built there. No shacks will be allowed. A little nervous about that one. And the other thing they really pushed was the fact that you had land out here, land enough for your child to have a pony. You could even have a goat cart for your children. So they were pushing the idea of extra space within this subdivision. Another ad, come out today. Put your feet on the soil and walk. Walk out where the air is pure and the grass is growing and the birds are singing. You will never forget it. And you will never want to live in the crowded, dirty city again. Wow. This was that appeal to the fact that Detroit was crowded by then. It was, in their opinion, it was dirty. Come out where you could breathe fresh air and hear the birds sing. So you can see the kinds of incentives they were, they were using. Large pieces of land, fresh air, birds singing. So now they will begin to develop it. Here was the, uh, this is the, the yellow rectangle is the Isaac Bond farm, which will remain there. And then you can see them begin to divide the land into these large sections. They called them estates a small estate with six large lots. So this was their plan to build, to build a subdivision that was unique in terms of the size. Then they said, we're gonna plan that the initial houses 
we will have designed and we will build. And then another incentive, a railway. It was already there. So not only did you have highways to take your, your, your car to work, but you could take the railway. That was the Detroit United Railway, which had started in the area in the, or, or just around 1900. It had a major route going out to Pontiac from Detroit, another down Orchard Lake, and then another coming in along essentially Grand River. So you were able not only to work in Detroit, but you could work in Pontiac and take the railway uh, to work. So it was, it was pushing the idea that transportation won't be a problem. The Detroit United was uh, also called an inner urban. It was electric. It was a massive system. Believe it or not, it came out to Little Ortonville. We actually had a depot in, in Ortonville, and it went from there onward, actually, all the way to Flint. Depots along the way, this was the Farmington DUR depot. And again, they usually moved by single car. Sometimes there were two cars together, um, but mainly single cars moving frequently during the day. And another incentive, they built a school, the Bond School. So now you had large lots, fresh air, you had railway transportation, road transportation, and your kids would have a neighborhood school. And then finally, the golf course. The golf course would be highly accessible to people. In the ad, by invitation only, and will be limited both as to numbers and quality. I always worry, I wonder who is going to decide the quality. I don't think it meant the quality of your golf game. So if you're a golfer and the right kind of man, you can join. Again, if you just think the flavor here is, is restriction. And then the architects chosen to design it, Butterfield and Butterfield, a Detroit architecture firm that eventually will end up centered in Farmington. That firm was made up of Wells Butterfield and his daughter, Emily Butterfield, a very unique partnership given the fact that Emily was a young woman and she was an architect. They had been working together to design particularly churches. This is a Methodist church in Farmington, but it's very similar to a lot of the churches. They designed together over 40 churches. They were instrumental in a change that was taking place in church architecture. This was the kind of church that was very prevalent before this time. Not a huge, large building, but the Butterfields were pushing a movement that said a church should be big enough to be used throughout the week. It should be the center of a community. So the churches were expanded to include sometimes a gymnasium, sometimes a stage, a kitchen, a meeting room, so that it had lots of possibilities for usage. This again is the Central Methodist. You can see the inside. They had, had, both Emily and her father had traveled through Europe and been fascinated by the churches there, these neo-Gothic churches with the, the vaulted ceilings, lots of stained glass. So their designs often had those features. This particular one is a Michigan designated historic site. They also designed some apartment buildings, uh, particularly in Detroit, Highland Park. They designed Highland Park High School. The inside of that, again, a lot of massive wood, high ceilings, tra tra traditional of the, of the kind of architecture that they were so good at. Now, how did Emily become an architect? In 1904, she was admitted to Syracuse University, one of the few universities at that time who accepted women into their architecture program. In 1907, 
she became the first woman to be a licensed architect in Michigan. In 1912, she was one of the founding members of the Detroit Business Women's Club. It was essentially the first professional women's club in the country. Her idea and the three or four people that started it was that it was tough to be a professional woman. And if they could come together to share ideas and share problems, it was going to be a good thing. She wrote a wonderful book. You know, I always like to see a book for students. She wrote a, a children's book of the story of architecture, really from the beginning of structures in Greece and Rome. And she dedicated it to my earliest art instructor, employer, business partner, my father, Wells Duane Butterfield. It is filled with these incredible little drawings of the places that she had seen in Europe. It's a wonderful book. In 1920, she helped establish a, a camp for underprivileged children in Jackson, Michigan. It was uh, begun by the Alpha Gamma Delta sorority, which she was a founding member of. What's cool is that she designed and supervised the construction of the camp buildings. And she actually was manager of the camp for four summers from 1920 to 1924. She was also a very accomplished artist, particularly in watercolors. Um, in those years, the J.L. Hudson, the great big department store on Woodward downtown, had an art gallery. And many of Emily's paintings were featured in that gallery. In 1914, she was included in the Woman's Who's Who of America. And in describing her, I found it interesting that she was involved in the women's suffrage movement. I've been doing a lot of work because this is the, has been the hundredth year of the 19th amendment. I've been doing a lot of work on Oakland County women who were involved in the women's suffrage movement. And it was exciting to see that Emily Butterfield was one of them. And I'm always interested in well, what they do for fun. And it was cool because it included it. And it said she liked swimming, sketching, tramping, and pansy culture. Well, the word tramping caught me for a bit. I thought, what did it mean if you like tramping? Well, I had to look up a different meaning of what I was thinking. And it turned out in, in the around the early 1900s, tramping was used like we would call hiking now. It was to walk long and far. She was someone who liked to be outside hiking. And pansy culture? That was a time when they were developing all these cool, beautiful colors of pansies that so many of us enjoy now. So she had a love of pansies. And she was selected and her father to design the houses, the initial houses and the clubhouse for the Oaklands. The more I read about their partnership, the more I believe it was Emily who designed most of the Oaklands. Oakland's. Sadly, it seems that in many cases, things that she designed were actually credited to her father because at that time, it was unusual for a woman to be an architect and some people didn't believe that women were capable of designing incredible structures. So I firmly believe that most of the Oakland uh, was designed by Emily. Each of the houses, the initial houses, there were about eight of them are unique. This one, now it's not a good photo, but look at the roof. That's called an ocean wave roof. Here's the house today, it's still there. And it was such a unique roof. Every house had something different about it. This is the one she called the Cotswold Cottage. It was owned by Edward Beals, who happened to be president of the Great Lakes Land Corporation. He had this one designed for him. Here it is today. It's an incredible, incredible structure, but cool in the inside, this massive fireplace. Now, had we been able to go to Glen Oaks today, 
you would have seen a fireplace that looks remarkably like that. There's one just outside moving a sitting room, moving into the banquet room. So we would be able to see that one. Here's one on Ardmore. This was owned by Glenn Reddock. He was the secretary of the Great Lakes Land Corporation. Here's another view of that house. Notice above the two side wings, the porch areas. Here it is today. I had to steal this from a real estate site. I couldn't exactly see it, but it, again, it's still there. This is the Archibald Jones house. Again, see how different they all are. Look how steep that roof is. He was treasurer of the Great Lakes Land Corporation. Now you're seeing a pattern here. All the officers of the corporation were the ones who purchased the first houses, including the Bach house. This was owned by Henry Bach. He was the vice president of the corporation. Now this house is different. Okay, it's different, not in style, but it's unique because if you look at it and you look at the shape, it should suggest barn to you. And it was a barn. It was Isaac Bond's barn. He had more than one barn, but this was a barn that Emily Butterfield decided to move across the fields from the Bond, from, from the, where the Bond buildings still were and incorporated in her to design. It's very different for her. I could not find any other case where she did that. And I'm curious about what it was about the barn, why she decided to do that. Unfortunately, I've not been able to find Emily Butterfield's personal papers, which means they're probably still with the family somewhere. But I'd love to know if she kept, so many architects kept notebooks uh, talking about their designs. I'd love to know more about this house. Again, all the houses had these large, large lots that came with them. So many had ornate gardens that they had, landscaping. And then, of course, Emily designed the clubhouse itself. It was completed in time for the 1926 season. But interestingly, the Bond School wasn't finished yet, so they used the banquet hall for the kids to go to school in for one year. So not only was it serving as the, as the initial clubhouse, but it was also a school. Now, if you look here and you think back to that church and some of the, and the apartment building that you saw in the school, it, this has elements of that. You've got that ornate stonework, turrets, which she loved to use, leaded glass windows, and of course, the vaulting slate covered roofs. And then the depression hit. As everything was up and running, of course, the depression hit. And essentially, everything was stopped. Everything was halted. The corporation essentially was in financial trouble. It was bankrupt. And it was just left like this. The roads were still there. House, houses isolated, eventually all vacant. Most of the land reverted to Isaac Bond. A lot of the land hadn't been purchased on, so his original farm hadn't been built on yet. So essentially, he was able to, to get that land back. I'm not sure how all of that worked, but he ended up with his farm again and went back to farming. What I could not find was whether he went back to seed potatoes. I'm not sure, but he did return to farming. Now, it won't be until around late 40s, early 50s, that housing will begin again in that area. These small little ranch houses um, that will look kind of more alike than the houses that Emily designed, they'll still push the golf club as being a, an integral part of the area. So here by 1963, you can see, particularly to the east of Orchard Lake, being platted for this new house division. And then by 74, in where the, where the estate houses were, 
and then it will fill in. It will fill in after that. So if we were to take a house like this, the Beale House, in 1940, that was the Beale House and the Beale property. If we look at it today, it's right there. Now these are not small lots, however. No, they're, they're still fairly large, but now you can see essentially what had been the, the Beale land has been divided. So this is, this is a subdivision still that has fairly large lots. And what about the school? Well, in 1982, the school was, as they said, recycled. I like to call it adaptive reuse. Um, but the school, instead of being demolished, like a lot of schools were at, uh, uh, that were this age at that time, it was turned into an office building. And if you look back, if you look at the shape, especially that center section, you can still see it there within that building. But honestly, if you drove by that building, you would never think that that was a school, except if you walk into the lobby, because a smart architect embedded the original marble plaque that was built when the school was uh, when the school was erected, kept that plaque in the inside. Now, what about the golf the, the golf club? The golf clubs survived, um, continued. Uh, continued as a semi uh, semi private and then eventually uh, uh, public. They even expanded it in 1952. They added to the banquet hall a kitchen and they added some golf locker rooms. And then it went through a series of different owners, and each owner seemed to try and find another way to encourage, entice people to come play golf, but also to use the banquet facilities and the restaurant they had. So you'll see some interesting ads here. For example, this one, whoops, let me go back here, open for dances, a pleasant secluded place for your holiday dance. There were attempts to get people to, oh, you know what, come have a dance here. Here's one of my favorites, one of the oddest. Dear fat boy, eat what you like, then come on out and taper down at the Glen Oaks Golf Club. Encouraging people, you can eat whatever you want, but you can come out, exercise by playing golf. A little different one. Husky bowlers like our tender steaks. It's not too soon to arrange your bowling banquet right now. How about it? Again, different ploys to different audiences. They were trying so hard to make a go of this golf course and the golf club. Simply where the fun begins, Glen Oaks Golf Club. This one, how long since you've taken a deep breath? Don't do a thing till you get out to Glen Oaks. The air is fresher, the sky is bluer, the birds sing lovelier. Glen Oaks Golf Club. Now think about that. They had used that enticement before. Remember when they were telling people, get out of the dirty city, come to where the birds are singing and the grass is green. And finally, for marriages that last forever, have your wedding reception in the new panoramic room. So it was very simple. If you wanted your marriage to last, just Go and have your reception at the panoramic room. Now, it lasted the golf club into the, 19, into the 1970s. But in 1974, the Detroit Shriners purchased it. Their intent was to build uh, one of their temples on the property and also a convalescent home that members of the Shriners would be able to use. That didn't pan out. That, that didn't pan out. The plans never were, were developed. And that's when Oakland County Parks was able to purchase the, the land, including the, the ready-made golf course for us. And then it will become a county park. And of course, in that purchase will be the incredible, the incredible golf club. 
we've actually added to that in the 1990s, we added a large banquet room. Um, again, that looks like this. Here's what's cool. This uh, Emily Butterfield was long gone by now, but when Parks decided to add it, they did a wise thing. They had an architect design it in the same traditions of Emily Butterfield, which is why the vaulted ceilings, the windows that are like that, which was cool. I got to tell you, we could have built this building cheaper had we gone a different route. But it was a wise move, and I didn't work for Parks then, but I'm so happy that they decided to do it in this way. So it honored her tradition, honored her, and the architecture that's in all the other parts of this structure. So now when I think about it, where once Milton Benjamin's cows grazed, people are still golfing. It's a very cool golf club. I'm not a golfer, but I've read that it's a very cool golf club. And what about Emily Butterfield? What happened with her? She continued to design with her father, lots more structures, and eventually she retired to a little island, Nebish Island, just off the eastern shore of the Upper Peninsula. It's in the St. Mary's River. Um, just south of Sault Ste. Marie. From what I understand, she had had a cottage there for some summers and decided to retire there. It's only accessible by, by freighter, or by freighter, by, by, um, by, uh, by ferry, so it's quite isolated. It's supposed to be beautiful, very rural, I can just see her tramping there, can't you? Can't you see her hiking? And I envision her there in a cottage with pansies all planted around it. I, I noticed that there's still a Butterfield Lane that shows up on the map, but I don't think her cottage is still there. But I did find something else cool. From 1937 into the 40s, Emily Butterfield was the postmaster of Nebish Island. Yes, she became, uh, she was actually, you have to be chosen by the federal government to be the postmaster. So she ended her wonderful career as a postmaster. Emily died in 1958. And she's buried in Oaklawn Cemetery in Algonac. That was actually where she was born, in Algonac. And she's buried right next to her business partner, her art teacher, her best friend, her father, Wells Butterfield. In 1990, she was inducted into the Michigan Women's Hall of Fame. And I have to tell you, Every time I'm in this particular room at Glen Oaks, especially if I'm sitting there before a presentation, because we've, we've done a couple of cool holiday things out there. Every time I'm sitting there, I just get the feeling that somewhere in that room is Emily Butterfield. So we have a railway seed potatoes, and a female architect. The story of Glen Oaks County Park. All right. Okay. All right, I'm gonna try and get you back again. Now, um, if you've had, and I was supposed to tell you in the beginning, which I forgot to do, if you had a question or a comment, just put it in the chat room and then we can, um, we can go through those because Sandy can see those. So hold on here, let me get you back. There we are. Anybody have questions or comments? 
Are we, are we live? Can you hear us? I can hear you, yeah. Okay, uh, very interesting. I played golf quite a bit at uh, Glen Oaks. And our, in 1994, our youngest daughter had her wedding reception in the building. Oh, I always love to hear that. You know, at, both at Addison Oaks and at Glen Oaks, we're trying to locate people who had their wedding there. We thought it would be cool to kind of have a, a collection, uh, a digital collection of uh, weddings over time. I think that would be cool. So we're, we're, we're working on that. Sounds is it a good idea. golf course? Is it a good golf course? They tell oh, me yeah. oh, that, uh, the, the ninth hole. Oh, okay. <laughs> the one thing I remember uh, okay. at the wedding was her husband is quite a golfer. And so one of the things he did before the, the dinner started was go out and hit a couple of golf balls. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that. You know, there's... Um, a lot of history about the um, the professionals who taught at the golf course starting in the 20s. I, I didn't, you'd probably recognize a lot of names, but there's some interesting history. And then there's a lot of people, a lot of um, Detroit Lions used to play at that golf course. There's a whole listing of people who've played there. Um, I, I have that all collected. I didn't put it in the presentation because I don't know enough about golf, but, but I have collected that. And eventually, we want to do something on golf history of Oakland County Parks. We want to use Springfield and White Lake Oaks and, uh, and, and, and Glen, and then do something um, that would honor our golf history. That's a neat project. Anybody else? I too uh, played golf there. I taught, actually played there uh, when my son was uh, learning how to play. And oh, cool. uh, it, it was really a nice golf course. And I've attended uh, many events there like, like Ron and Shirley, uh, weddings, bar mitzvahs. Uh, and it's, uh, it, it's a wonderful venue. It, it's terrific. Um, and you, and Sure, go ahead, Alex. No, 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 no. Uh, the, your presentation has been absolutely fantastic. It's been, uh, it, it's been wonderful. And I love how you integrated in with uh, the rest of the county development and the history. It really brings it to life. And I, I do have one question, though, and it's about the seed potatoes. Mm -hmm. And you showed us a photo of uh, all the uh, trucks, uh, the farmers that came to purchase the seed potatoes. And I was wondering why, um, why did farmers purchase the potatoes? Were they for sale to the general public or was it only for farmers? No, he, those particular ones are the seed potatoes that the farmers planted to get potatoes. So the, he, he sold potatoes. In fact, the Eastern Market, I think he did a lot of work down there. But those little ones, those are the little seed potatoes that farmers would buy to plant in the spring. So they were replicating the potatoes that he had perfected. I see. Thank you. Sure. Anybody else? Well, our December um, uh, uh, fat fireside chat will be about the Buell Mansion. Um, we traditionally go to the Buell at holiday time and camp this year, but I will be showing you some pictures of it decorated during the holiday season. And it's a fa the Buell family history is fascinating, but actually so is the history of the Snyder and the Shoemaker families. So I'll go back in time. This time I'll actually go back to Native American history, which is incredible in that area and build it up through time. So I hope you'll join me then. Um, uh, Sandy has that date. It, it, it's on the, on the main flyer. And then we plan to do uh, January through April still with some more topics. I'll be doing one on, uh, on archeology span in the parks and I'll be doing one on the Bailey house and then uh, a couple surprise ones. So if no, if no one has, enjoy the day. The sun is actually out here in Ortonville.
And we're celebrating today, my granddaughter turns nine months old. So we're having a little party. This is a child who we just realized hasn't met anybody in the family except through FaceTime because of the pandemic. So she, she only knows her family in little tiny squares, but we're celebrating today and having some family members join in via, actually we're gonna Zoom with some of them. So everyone have a great day.